Hello, this is Shmuel Moshe, and you are listening to the Weekly Parshacast, the weekly Torah portion podcast where I read the weekly Torah portion and then provide my own interpretation based on my own understanding of the text. As always, I remind everybody I am not a Torah scholar, just somebody who wished to study the Torah. This week's parasha is Parasha Pekudei, landing on the 6th of Adar Bet, 5784, March 16th, 2024. You could follow along with the text on Chabad.org in English. Without further ado, let's jump on in with the first portion. The translation of Pekudei, Amounts of. Exodus chapter 38, verse 21, first portion. These are the numbers of the Mishkan, the Mishkan of the testimony, which were counted at Moses' command. This was the work of the Levites under the direction of Itamar, the son of Aaron the Kohen. Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, had made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. With him was Aholiab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, a craftsman and master weaver, and an embroiderer in blue, purple, and crimson wool, and in linen. All the gold that had been used for the work, in all the work of the holy, the gold of the waving, was twenty-nine talents, seven hundred and thirty shekels, according to the holy shekel. The silver of the community members was one hundred talents and one thousand seven hundred and seventy-five shekels, according to the holy shekel. One beck up her head, that is half a shekel, according to the holy shekel, for each one who goes through the counting, from twenty years old and upward, for six hundred three thousand five hundred and fifty people. One hundred talents of silver were used for casting the sockets of the holy and the sockets of the dividing curtain, one hundred sockets out of one hundred talents, one talent for each socket. And out of the one thousand seven hundred and seventy-five shekels, he made hooks for the pillars, and he covered their tops and banded them. The copper of the waving was seventy talents and two thousand four hundred shekels. From that he made the sockets of the entrance to the tent of meeting, the copper altar, the copper grating upon it, and all the implements of the altar. And the sockets of the courtyard all around, and the sockets at the gate to the courtyard, all the pegs of the Mishkan, and all the pegs of the courtyard all around. Chapter 39, verse 1, And out of the blue, purple, and crimson wool they made the meshwork garments to serve in the holy, and they made Aaron's holy garments as the Lord had commanded Moses. So just to briefly summarize, we got a breakdown of what was created in the previous portion, right? The command was to make all the different implements and instruments and, and components that would go into the Mishkan. And now we have seen that it has been done. We get the exact counting of the amount of gold and silver and things of that nature. We also get an affirmation of the measurements, right? So we see how much it is relative to talents, and then we also see how much that corresponds to in holy shekels. So I think this is a kind of a Rosetta Stone for metrics to see, okay, this many talents equals this many shekels according to the holy metric. So based on those metrics and measures, we get those informations. And uh, we get a little bit more breakdown, followed by, of course, the construction of the outfit for Aaron. That's everything in that portion. All right, on to the second portion, chapter 39, verse 2. And he made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool, and twisted fine linen. They hammered out the sheets of gold, and cut threads from them to work the gold into the blue wool, into the purple wool, and into the crimson wool, and into the fine linen, the work of a master weaver. They made connecting shoulder straps for it at both its ends. It was entirely connected. And its decorative band, which is above it, emanated from it, of the same work, gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool, and twisted fine linen, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they prepared the shoham stones enclosed in gold settings, engraved similar to the engravings of a seal with the names of the sons of Israel. And he put them onto the shoulder straps of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the choshen, the work of a master weaver, like the work of the ephod, of gold, blue, purple, and crimson wool, and twisted fine linen. It was square, and they made the choshen doubled its length, one span, and its width one span doubled. And they filled into it four rows of stones, one row odem, pita, and barket, the one row, and the second row nofek, sapir, and yahalom, and the third row, Leshem, Shevo, and Achlama. And the fourth row, Tarshish, Shoham, and Yashpeh, enclosed in gold settings in their fillings. And the stones were for the names of the sons of Israel, twelve, corresponding to their names, similar to the engravings of a seal, every one according to his name for the twelve tribes. For the Choshen, they made chains at the edges of cable work of pure gold. They made two golden settings and two golden rings, and they placed the two rings on the two ends of the Choshen. And they placed the two golden cables on the two rings at the ends of the Choshen. And the two ends of the two cables they placed upon the two settings, and they placed them upon the shoulder straps of the ephod on its front part. 
and they made two golden rings and placed them onto the two ends of the Choshen, on its edge that faced the inner side of the ephod. And they made two golden rings and placed them on the two shoulder straps of the ephod from below toward its front, adjacent to its seam, above the band of the ephod. And they fastened the Choshen by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a cord of blue wool so that it could be upon the band of the ephod, so that the Choshen would not move off the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. So once again, much like last week's Torah portion, a lot of this is fixated on the the methodology in which they fulfilled the commandments being given to Moses, these crafters and weavers and so on. Specifically, the work of a master weaver indicates its quality. And also, we're hearing how it was how it was done, right? So it was commanded to Moses, he relayed that information, and now they are fulfilling each piece step by step, just as was commanded. I think the significance here is that somebody could use this again as a blueprint in the future. The Torah is meant to be the eternal living document or however to describe it, of the Jewish people, of B'nai Israel. So you have a document here that ex- is very explicitly describing how you can create an appropriate, holy, sanctified Mishkan relative to the commands given to Moses. So if it was 2,000 years, 3,000 years later, somebody could follow these specific steps if they met the credentials, right? So we understand who has been given this wisdom, right? So we hear about uh, the, the particular craftsmen, and we also hear that with their wisdom, it was passed on to a new generation of craftsmen. So these are the original crafters, but the work is is transmitted through skill and things like that. So in theory... They may be the founders, just like Aaron is the original Kohen, but there will be Kohens after him. These crafters are the original crafters, but there are crafters after them as well. And they are able to fulfill this particular command. And anybody, in theory, who follows the Torah could do it themselves as well, so long as they follow these very specific step-by-step instructions on how they did it exactly as they were told. One solid piece, all the details, the specific stones. Once again, mentioning the the names for the stones are given in Hebrew. This is so we don't have any misunderstandings like ruby, sapphire, emerald. No, it's odem, pida, barket. I will say sapir, I'm pretty sure, is sapphire. But aside from that, they're all relatively different sounding from the names that we might know together today, other than the word gold, right? So read this closely if you want to know how to make this properly. Third portion, chapter 39, verse 22. And he made the robe of the ephod, the work of a weaver, completely of blue wool, and the opening of the robe was turned inward like the opening of a coat of armor. Its opening had a border around it so that it should not be torn. And they made on the bottom hem of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple, and crimson wool twisted. And they made bells of pure gold, and they placed the bells in the midst of the pomegranates all around on the bottom hem of the robe, in the midst of the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around on the bottom hem of the robe, to serve as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they made the linen tunics the work of a weaver for Aaron and his sons. And the cap of linen, and the glorious high hats of linen, and the linen pants of twisted fine linen, and the sash of twisted fine linen, and blue, purple, and crimson wool of embroidery work as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they made the show plate, the holy crown, of pure gold, and they inscribed upon it an inscription like the engravings of a seal, Holy to the Lord. And they placed upon it a cord of blue wool to place over the cap from above as the Lord had commanded Moses. All the work of the Mishkan of the tent of meeting was completed. The children of Israel had done it according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they had done. Something I want to point out about this now that we've reached the end of the third portion. We are getting a very clear narration of the events that took place. Often we're hearing quotes. So typically it'll be, and then God said to Moses, or, and then Moses repeated to the people, But in these portions, we've been seeing a lot less dialogue and purely just a recollection of what was witnessed. Again, the testament, right? It's a testimony. So the narrator, the witness, who is the witness? Well, based on the source of the Torah being given to Moses, dictated by the Lord, the witness to this is the Lord. So interestingly, I just wanted to kind of point that out because this work at this point is entirely narrative and not uh, dialogue. But we also see each piece step by step. Once again, if somebody was to fulfill these commandments again in the future, they know exactly the order that it should be done in. And there are no confusions here about what should be done. Bell by bell by bell by pomegranate by bell and so on. It's all there. You could follow it to a T. And if you fulfill these instructions, you too, at your own verse 32, will say all the work of the tent was completed. And there you have it. This is kind of maybe a, I don't know if this is the wrong thing to say, but something that comes to my mind is, you know, without the, the holy temple, 
they can't fulfill, they being the, the Kohanim, cannot fulfill their obligation. They're waiting for the Holy Temple. But I, I do wonder sometimes why a, a new Mishkan is not created of sorts that can follow these commandments. The Kohanim are still alive. Can they not restore it? Can they not facilitate this? If if the command is to, to Aaron and his descendants, if his descendants are still known, even if we're missing pieces, do we not have enough to be able to make our own portable tent of meeting? Is it just a matter of inconvenience? I'm curious about the, I guess, the rabbinical justification for not attempting to recreate what is commanded here for the sake of the diaspora, because at this time, the people of Israel are in exile, they're in the desert, and so are the people around the world. And even now, uh, the state of Israel, right, being a country, but it is not a Torah country. It is a country that, you know, there's a difference between a country that follows the Torah as its as its law versus its own laws. And I think you can look at that from an objective standpoint and say, yes, the Torah is not the definitive law of the land in the land of the country called Israel, uh, but rather it is just a government that exists in a land that is the promised land, but does not follow the law given to Moses. So uh, just a kind of an interesting thought there for me as I think about the socio-political qualities of the land of Israel relative to the Torah and its specific commandments of what must be done. Anyway, now that that tangent's over, on to the fourth portion, chapter 39, verse 33. Now they brought the Mishkan to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its planks, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets. The covering of ram skins dyed red, the covering of tachash skins, and the screening dividing curtain. The ark of the testimony and its poles and the ark cover. The table, all its implements, and the showbread. The pure menorah, its lamps, the lamps to be set in order, and all its implements, and the oil for the lighting. The golden altar, the anointing oil, and the incense, and the screen of the entrance to the tent. The copper altar and its copper grating its poles and all its implements, the washstand and its base, the hangings of the courtyard, its pillars and its sockets, and the screen for the gate of the courtyard, its ropes and its pegs, and all the implements for the service of the Mishkan of the Tent of Meeting, the meshwork garments for the service in the Holy, the holy garments for Aaron the Kohen, Gadol, and his son's garments for the serving as Kohanim. In accordance with all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel do all the work. Moses saw the entire work, and lo, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, so they had done. So Moses blessed them. So basically, here we have a final confirmation. Uh, yes, you did it. Moses told you what to do. You followed the instructions as the Lord commanded Moses and Moses commanded you. You did exactly. This game of telephone did not result in a mistranslation. Everything was good. And Moses offered them a blessing for having fulfilled the commands of the Lord. Fairly straightforward, but we got it once again. This is all just step by step. These are the pieces. This was the assembly. This was the process. And it's exactly as it was commanded. And they received the blessing for having done it right. Again, if somebody follows these instructions, in theory, perhaps you too could do it right. I guess without dwelling on that too intensely, what is stopping people from doing it again? Oh, there is the lack of the pieces that go in there, right? The jar of mana and and other things like that that need to be inside of it. But, you know, at the same time, though these things are permanent statutes, if Moses was able to destroy the tablets and then get another set, we may not have Moses today, but surely there's some sort of parallel that can be found for the ability for the people of Israel to to reacquire the necessary holy artifacts. Maybe. Even if it's not the original ones, Perhaps they can be given in another way. After all, it's not impossible. If Moses was able to go and find God and, and do this thing, maybe it's possible. Just, just speculation on my part. Fifth portion, chapter 40, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the day of the first month, on the first of the month, you shall set up the Mishkan of the Tent of Meeting. There you shall place the Ark of the Testimony, and you shall spread the dividing curtain toward the Ark. You shall bring in the table and set its arrangements. You shall bring in the menorah and its kindle its lamps. You shall place the golden altar for incense before the Ark of the Testimony, and you shall place the screen of the entrance to the Mishkan. You shall place the altar of the burnt offering in front of the entrance of the Mishkan to the Tent of Meeting. You shall place the washstand between the Tent of Meeting and the altar, and there you shall put water. And you shall set up the courtyard all around, and you shall put up the screen for the gate to the courtyard. You shall take the anointing oil and anoint the Mishkan and everything within it, and you shall sanctify it in all its furnishings. Thus it will become a holy thing. You shall anoint the altar for the burnt offering and all its implements. You shall sanctify the altar. Thus the altar will become a holy of holies. 
You shall anoint the washstand in its base and sanctify it. And you shall bring Aaron and his sons near the entrance of the tent of meeting, and you shall bathe them in water. And you shall clothe Aaron with the holy garments, and you shall anoint him and sanctify him so that he may serve me as a Kohen. And you shall bring his sons near and clothe them with the tunics. And you shall anoint them as you have anointed their father, so that they may serve me as Kohanim. And this shall be so that their anointment shall remain for them an everlasting kahuna throughout their generations." Thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. And a fifth portion. So on the day of the first month, on the first of the month, right? So this is talking about the process that's going to happen on the day of the first month, the beginning of the year, right? Rosh Chodesh. Uh, but I don't believe it's Rosh Hashanah. Rather, I think it's Nisan. I'm not, I'm not sure 100% which of these is the first month on the day of the first month, on the first of the month, right? Because we have Nisan being given as the first month in one context, Rosh Hashanah being the start of the year in another context. But I'm assuming this is related to the month of Nisan. Anyway, we'll continue from there. He tells Moses and company exactly what they're going to do, how they're going to sanctify it, what they're going to do, and uh, how to make sure they keep it holy, as well as how Aaron and his children will receive everything. So here we are talking about how it's going to be done. This is before the very first time Aaron has served as Kohen Gadol in this place, right? So this is basically saying, like, we're going to have our grand opening of the Mishkan on the first day of the first of the month uh, of, the, of the year, or on the first month, first day, grand opening, brand new tent of meeting, be there for the ribbon cutting ceremony. Aaron's going to be elevated to Kohen Gadol. His sons are going to be blessed so that it'll pass on to their descendants. It's going to be wonderful. Please look forward to it. And uh, it's going to last forever. So that's what Moses does. On to the sixth portion, chapter 40, verse 17. It came to pass in the first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the Mishkan was set up. Moses set up the Mishkan, placed its sockets, and put up its planks, put in its bars, and set up its pillars. He spread the tent over the Mishkan, and he placed the cover of the tent over it from above as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took and placed the testimony into the ark, put the poles upon the ark, and placed the ark cover on the ark from above. He brought the ark into the Mishkan and placed the screening dividing curtains so that it formed a protective covering before the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the table in the tent of meeting on the northern side of the Mishkan, outside the dividing curtain. He set upon it an arrangement of bread before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the menorah in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the southern side of the Mishkan. He kindled the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the golden altar in the tent of meeting in front of the dividing curtain. He made the incense go up and smoke upon it as the Lord had commanded Moses. So, now we find out, right, I was talking about the beginning of the year. So, I believe this is now the second year, the first month on the first day, so I believe this is Nisan, day one, year two, right? So they've been in exile for a year. And now that a full year has passed, they're commemorating, they're kicking off the special event. We are opening up the Mishkan, setting it up, and Moses does it step by step as he is commanded. Interestingly, this is another piece of food for thought, and I'm sure there's been a lot of commentary about this throughout the years. Why is it that Aaron's family becomes the holy family rather than Moses himself? If, if Moses is the one receiving all of this information, why are these blessings being given to Aaron and not to Moses? I suppose thinking of an excuse in this moment, the reason it goes to Aaron instead of Moses is because when he first encountered God in the in front of the burning bush, he passed off that blessing that he would have received for his own descendants and shouldered it onto his brother. That's my guess. This is a sort of punishment for having not accepted God's commandment immediately and questioning it and saying, well, what about my brother? So fine, if you want to exalt your brother, I will exalt your brother and his seed to be the holiest of men inside of this community. That's my theory, just based on the way things seem to work out a lot in the sort of, you know, take the wrong step and you pay the price or say the wrong thing and, and it, there's a consequence later on. Those are my interpretations based on this. But nonetheless, Moses, without any question, does exactly as commanded and he fulfills the commands to set up the tent of meeting. Seventh portion, chapter 40, verse 28. He placed the screen for the entrance of the Mishkan. The altar of the burnt offering he placed in front of the entrance of the Mishkan of the Tent of Meeting. He offered up the burnt offering and the meal offering upon it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the washstand between the Tent of Meeting and the altar, and there he put water for washing. And Moses, Aaron, and his sons would wash their hands and their feet from it. 
When they entered the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they would wash as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set up the courtyard all around the Mishkan, and the altar, and he put up the screen at the entrance to the courtyard, and Moses completed the work. And the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the Mishkan. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud rested upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the Mishkan. When the cloud rose up from over the Mishkan, the children of Israel set out in all their journeys. But if the cloud did not rise up, they did not set out until the day that it rose. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the Mishkan by day, and there was fire within it at night, before the eyes of the entire house of Israel in all their journeys. So now we have it by creating this tent of meeting, a dwelling place for the Lord to be among the people. It was a physical manifestation of the Lord in smoke and in fire. So very cool stuff, very powerful stuff representing the uh, commandments and all that actually manifesting in such a significant way. Here we have it. The Lord and all that is uh, commanded leads to... Da, 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 the Lord dwelling among the people. I was thinking more about the situation with Moses and Aaron and who gets to be the Kohanim and stuff like that as I was reading that, and I thought of another explanation beyond Moses deferring to his brother. It may also be because Aaron was born before Moses, right? And we do hear that your firstborn belonged to me. So maybe Aaron being the firstborn of the two brothers gets that benefit as the older brother, right? That's his honor, his responsibility. That definitely checks out. But also perhaps the descendants thing if it's the house of Aaron that is that is given this inheritance, that may be because of the order of their birth. It may be because of what Moses had done. It may also be because of the conditions around each of their respective families. Moses did live in exile, and he did have a family with a foreigner. It, now, regardless of the fact that his wife did fulfill what was commanded and made sure the children were circumcised. Another thing that Moses fell short on, which was very important, which may also have cost him something down the road, if not already almost killed him, uh, that may also be related to part of it. Even though it seems that the conversion of this woman into the people of Israel was complete, it, this is a context difference between the sons of the Kohanim coming from, I guess, thoroughbreds, if you will. Nonetheless, I, I don't think that necessarily makes them any lesser. Moses is still the man. But it is interesting to me that the children of Moses don't get nearly as much focus as the children of Aaron. Again, I think the most rational explanation is Aaron's the firstborn, then also Moses deferred the benefit because it's not like we haven't seen instances of the not firstborn being the blessed one. Isaac, Jacob, you know, it happens throughout the history. The two sons of Joseph even. So that's uh, something that really lingered on my mind. But in any case, the people now see that the Lord is dwelling among them and they only move when the Lord moved from that place. And even when the Lord is in there, Moses can't go in. It's just like that is the house of the Lord. Not even Moses can enter. Just something to think about. Very powerful stuff. In any case, that is the end of this week's Torah portion. Another very quick and short one. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found it interesting and uh, valuable. I certainly did. But nonetheless, that is the end of Pekudei. We learned all about the final creation steps of the Mishkan and how the Lord came to dwell physically manifested in smoke and fire amongst the people of Israel. Very, very powerful stuff. All right, folks. Well, thanks again for listening. I hope you'll tune in next time. Until then, this has been Shmuel Moshe with the Weekly Par Shawcast signing off. Until then, Baruch Hashem.